And now, with Sound Investing, here's Paul Merriman. Well, I don't know how many times I have said, this is probably the most important podcast I've ever done. But let me tell you, when I think back to what our then very, very small organization was in 2012 when we started, we had nothing. We had, a, 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 I think, three books that we were offering free to people, and, um, and we're doing a podcast. We didn't have tables and all sorts of studies that, that Daryl and, and Chris have done to make our followers much, much better investors. And today, I really think we're putting the cherry on the top of the cake because we have been delivering to you the ultimate buy and hold strategy update every year for, for ever since we started this process. We have been updating, fine tuning your asset allocation. And I can tell you, Daryl is working on the rest of these tables and they're coming out soon. But the bottom line is, we got one that while we did touch on it last year, uh, that is a must to update. And part of the reason is because uh, we did, I think about a year ago, if I'm not mistaken, Daryl, we did a no-nonsense um, portfolio study that showed a bunch of different strategies. Uh, and then I was asked to speak to the the White Coat Investor Conference uh, a few weeks ago, and, uh, and, 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 and I chose as a topic an article they wrote about in 2014 entitled 150 Portfolios Better Than Yours. And that is actually now up over 200 portfolios uh, but uh, Jim Dahl, the, the uh, person who runs the organization, uh, decided to keep the old title because so many people came to it on the internet, but it's over 200 portfolios. And the concept is that any of these portfolios are likely to do better than yours. And so what I wanted to do, I wanted to dig in and give these people information about those portfolios so they would understand some of those portfolios are built to make 10% theoretically. Some are met, meant to make 11, some 12, some even more than 12. And I'm not sure those folks are aware of that background. So Daryl, as always, came through like a champ, produced some tables for me that I could present that not only showed an update to the no-nonsense tables, but also the new pieces on this 150 portfolios better than yours. So now we're going to put that information to work. And I think you will walk away with three to 10 new lessons about the understanding how investing truly works and helping to create what I think is one of the most important aspects of becoming a successful investor, and that is to build reasonable expectations. Because if you get, uh, if you uh, assume the wrong expectations, you get yourself in trouble because things just don't look right when they are totally right. So Daryl is here, Chris is here, and uh, I'm going to... Uh, lean into these tables, and then we're going to discuss them. And at the end, I think it's going to be a super conversation. In fact, it may be a separate uh, podcast altogether, but we're going to dig into the question, which portfolio is best for you? And we got a whole bunch of different kinds of investors that follow our work. So we'll do our best to sort through those and help you pick the right one. So gentlemen, thank you uh, for, for joining me. I'm going to uh, go ahead and pull up the, uh, the, 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 the starting tables here. Let's see. Yeah, there we go. And that's, uh, that's the right one. All right, here we go. What we did initially 
was build a series of tables. And the purpose of these tables was really to investigate these different kinds of portfolios. Many of them you'll recognize because they are the very portfolios that we use for the people who follow our work. But we wanted to go beyond that. We wanted to go uh, and go into these tables, other tables that are very commonly assumed to be kind of the best to be that there is. Uh, for, for example, as you look at table 1A, by the way, uh, I hope that most of you will be able to see this as a video. But, and I'll be careful, and I know Daryl and Chris are always careful in this regard, to try to make it usable even for the person who is listening to the podcast. But I can tell you what we're looking at right here. It's a table that shows a series of one fund, two fund, three fund, and four fund portfolios. And the only thing we're looking at are the equities. We don't care about the bond portion because that's a totally different problem for investors. We wanna focus on to the extent that I have equities in my portfolio, what combination of equities are likely to treat me uh, within my need for return and, and, and within my risk tolerance? So what do we got? We got the S&P 500 as the single equity position. We've got the U.S. total market. That would be the total market fund, for example, at Vanguard or Fidelity. Uh, but, but it is a cap-weighted portfolio of more than the S&P 500, typically around 3,500 securities in that portfolio, all U.S. Then we've got the total world market portfolio. Now, the total world market, you can actually buy that, is, is, is basically a combination cap-weighted, which means whatever, whether it's the U.S. or the internationals, wherever the highest value of these public companies are, that will determine what that weighting is. So it's not a 50-50 split. It will be overweighted to that part of the world securities that have the highest value right now. That would be U.S. over international. And then we have the two fund portfolios. Now, remember I said, we're only looking at the equity. So when we look at the three fund equity, the three fund portfolio for Bogleheads, I'm sure a lot of you know that portfolio, that's some total market US, some total market international, and then a certain percentage in bonds. All I wanna know is how did the equity portion do? And then we have a couple of portfolios that represent uh, something we made up in a sense because uh, I wanted to combine something with the total market indexes, both the U.S. and the total world index. And I wanted just to include along with that some small cap value. We talk a lot about small cap value. So the question is, what would happen if you had a 70% total U.S. market and 30% small cap value? What would happen if you had a total world portfolio and 30% small cap value? And then another portfolio is all U.S. only. So those are all two fund strategies. And then we have a three fund strategy from Rick Ferry, and we have three, four fund strategies in this mix, one US only, one worldwide. Uh, and you've seen those four fund strategies often in the work that we do. And then an all value portfolio worldwide. So there are nine portfolios. Uh, Let's see, when, uh, maybe it's uh, closer to uh, 11. Me, 11. 11. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, at 78, I'm having trouble counting. And by the way, my site is, is failing too. So I may call for help here. So here's, here's what we then did. We, we determined using the dimensional indexes, dimensional funds, indexes, that, that they take all, in many cases, all the way back to the 1920s. But we have these indexes for all the different asset classes that these different portfolios would represent. 
And so what happens if we then, excuse me one second here. What happens when, and, and by the way, Daryl, when I first saw this, I it, it just, I got so excited because it, it makes these hugely important points so vividly. In table 2A1, what you see are the results of all of these different portfolios in the one and two fund categories. We'll look at the three and four in just a second. But Daryl put a green box around the a series of, of these columns of returns. And what was inside the green box is one, the compound annualized growth rate from 1970 to 1921, uh, 2021. Also, by the way, it also shows the 52 year growth of a $10,000 investment in 1970. And then it shows what happened from 70 to 79, 80 to 89, 90, 99, 2000 to 2009, and then finally 2010 through 2021. So we can get a very an easy way to compare the results of these different portfolios. I love the, the easy one to look at is what did the $10,000 grow to? And in the case of the S&P 500, that was 2.3 million approximately. In the case of the total market index, it was 2.4 million. So during that period of time, uh, even though the returns both show 11.1%, uh, the rounding uh, gave the total market index a, an advantage. But the bottom line is the, 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 the risk and return of the S&P 500 and the total market index are almost the same, whether you go back to 1970 or you go back to uh, 1928. And then the world market, the total world market. Remember, over 2 million with the US, but when you put the world, the US and international together during that same 1970 through 2021, it grew to 1.9 million, a pretty substantial difference, about another $400,000 over under the, sorry, under the uh, S&P 500 in the total market. And interestingly enough, about the same rate of return from the Bogleheads strategy, but the strategy that's 30% small cap value and 70% total market index, because as you've learned, I'm sure there is an advantage historically because it's more risky to small cap value. And boy, did that show up, 4.6 million uh, for that portfolio uh, versus the total world with a small cap value was 4.3, I'm sorry, 4.8 million. So both of those small cap value additions were hugely helpful. And then just to make you salivate a little bit, <laughs> we have the uh, remember, these are two fund portfolios, the equity portion, assuming an all U.S. only value portfolio, half large, half small. And what do we see? We see nine, almost $9.5 million, uh, over four times the, uh, uh, the return of the S&P 500, uh, either the total market or the S&P. Uh, that's a huge, huge increase. <clears throat> now, the implication when you see that, I'm, I'm, I'm curious, guys, when you see that big a difference in return, what are you assuming truly about the risk? What do you say, Chris? Well, it, uh, you know, uh, at one level, if you backed way up and you look at the chart, you would say it confirms the simple the simple things that Fama and French's academics identified years and years ago, that that if you invest in the smaller part of the market or the value part of the market over the very long term, your expected return is higher. Uh, and, you know, on a year by year basis, 
it doesn't necessarily pay out. There's there's periods of time here at the bottom where you would have been better off in large and better off in growth. And mm -hmm. so you, you never know when the return is going to come. But over this long period of time, uh, and even if you took rolling periods of time, many of them paid you back well for it. Uh, so yeah. even though the difference is small on a year by year basis, uh, it's big when you accumulate it over the long term. And it, you know, it's huge. You go from 2 million for the, uh, it's all, all of the broad market with no tilt to small in value came in around two to two and a half million. And the ones that tilted came in at 4.3 to 9.5 million, depending on how much they tilted towards small in value. So that's a huge, huge difference across a lifetime, but it's the accumulation of small differences over long periods of time. Um, and the yeah. risk, the, the downside risk, uh, it, there is more, there's more volatility. I think for most people, they'll feel it more in drawdown or day-to-day -day variation in their account value. And whether they have the stomach for that or not, who knows, right? I mean, that's, that's one of the biggest questions in here. Yeah. Um, but it is, it, it's always uh, comforting to see that, that this observation made by academics more than 20 years ago still holds up, Yeah, that, that there's value in investing in these riskier assets if you can stay the course. So that's great, Chris. And, and, and Daryl, I, I look at the standard deviation. When you look at the standard deviation, what are you assuming about the all value U.S. in terms of, of, of risk? Would you expect that it would somehow be scarier to be in that all value strategy? Yeah, I think almost certainly you would expect that. <clears throat> I mean, the, the reason, you know, you know the, the expected return for uh, the all value portfolio is higher. So you would think that, okay, the reason why it's higher is because there's more risk involved. And generally, eventually, the risk does show up. And so you would expect the standard deviation, I would expect the standard deviation to be higher as you go into the higher, higher um, return, higher expected returns. So I would be curious about the, the volatility of it. Um, but I would also be curious about the, where the volatility is. Is it yes. on the upside or is it on the downside? And so, you, and so when you look at the, and I'm jumping ahead of you here a little bit, I guess, but when, no, you, look that's the, great. when you look at the red boxes and you look at the worst down year, they're all pretty much the same. 38, 39, 40% for the worst down year. Yeah. But then when you look at the best up year, you see that, oh, okay, well, there's 37, 38. Oh, there's a 50, 37. There's a 46. There's a 45. There's a 56. Okay, so the upsides are, are pretty much higher. And that, of course, explains why the returns, why the, why the expected return is higher. So the volatility, the volatility in terms of the worst drawdown and the best run up, if you will, <clears throat> on an annual basis is is the, the better run-ups occur and as you're more tilted to the small cap value, which you would expect. So that makes me wonder whether or not the worst drawdowns that you see are really reflective of, of the, the bumpiness of the ride yeah. um, and, and whether or not that's, that's really the, the case. And so then we can get into that a little later when we go down and we look at things like the, the sharp ratio versus the Sortino ratio. But so um, I, if I if I can, I think one way to um, uh, rationalize that or reconcile it with what we know about the drawdowns being deeper for a portfolio that tilts more to small or more to value is that you're falling from a greater height. Um, so, you know, if you look at somebody who's been invested in small cap value for 50 years, uh, and has has a you know a larger portfolio here at the end than they would have had in the total market. They have more of that portfolio at risk, but um, they're falling from a much greater height. Yeah. 
Uh, so one of the reasons the deeper drawdowns don't show up in this analysis is that sometimes the drawdowns take multiple years to accumulate. And so by only looking at how much you're down in a single year or up in a, in a single year, uh, you, you kind of miss out on the fact that, uh, you know, after three years, you might be down a, a lot more in an all value portfolio or a 30% tilted small cap value portfolio than you would be in a total world market. Um, so that's true. But I think when we look down at, at the decadal observations down below, when you look at the standard deviations and the sharp ratios and the Sortino ratios on the decade by decade basis, then you get you get a little bit more longer term uh, view of, of things. And that should incorporate some of that uh, multi year run up or, or run down, if you will. But here's what I saw that I just thought was so simple. And I'm not sure that what I concluded intuitively is legitimate, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna at least try this. In theory, what we're worried about as an investor is not volatility on the upside. That rarely scares people, although a lot of people panic and think they better take their profit now before it goes back down to where it was. But generally, our concern is about losing money. And one of the things you did here, Daryl, that I, again, I, I don't know if I'm making an, an uh, I'm concluding something that isn't, uh, isn't right, but you summed all of the losing years. In other words, the S&P 500 had 10 losing years. The average was about 14.6%, but the total the adding accumulating all of the losing years was a total of 145.9%. So in a sense, that was, if, if it all happened at once, obviously you're in big trouble, but that's what you had to live with over this 52 year period. On the other hand, if we look at the total US market and the 30% small cap value there, they also had 10 down years. But the total of all 10 of those down years was 123%. In other words, that portfolio was, was in essence, in that regard, less risky than the S&P 500. On the other hand, in the up years, and they both had 42 up years, the average return for the S&P was 18.4 versus 20.3 for the total US S small cap value combination. So where the higher volatility came was not on the downside. The higher volatility, at least over this particular period of years, was mostly on the upside, which nobody, again, I think, complains about. So. It made me think, have I worried too much about the downside with these diversified portfolios? So have I concluded something that for some reason is not right? Can either one of you uh, call me to task on this one? Well, I think, I think the summing of the, of the down years and the summing of the up years is, is you, you, suggested that we look at this when we built this table. <clears throat> and I think that that's kind of a, I don't see it shown that way very often. But one of the, one of the ways that I think about this is, I think about, you know, when you're looking at a, at a hike or a bike ride in the mountains, they've got, you know, the, the up distance and the down distance. How long are you hiking uphill and how long are you hiking downhill? And uh, so this is kind of the same way. You know, when they say, well, you hike 14 miles up and 22 miles down, and you think, well, okay, I'm going mostly down. That's probably better than going up yeah. in the long run. And here it's kind of the opposite. You, you look at, well, I'm in the, in the S&P 500, for example, I'm going 446% down and 742% up. Well, that sounds pretty good. You know, and then you can look at, you can compare and contrast the paths you take, if you will. Mm -hmm. By, by looking at the up and down. Now, the, these don't translate exactly to how much you gain necessarily or, or what your ending portfolio value is directly because it's sort of, well, I guess, well, we're not adding anything here, right? 
no, this, so this is just an initial investment. So it doesn't matter what the sequence yep, is. That's right. But, um, <clears throat> but it's but it's an interesting way to look at it. Um, I'm not sure the academics would necessarily find find it of interest. Maybe they would, but I think it's useful for individual investors to look and understand what the differences are in terms of the up and down. And uh, and and also, by the way, uh, where you broke out the decade, the 10 year returns from 70 to 79, 80, 89, et cetera. I think that tells a tale as well. That's pretty doggone important because we never know where in our lives I'm at 78. If I live 10 more years, what will they look like? Which of these, well, these decades will they look at? And I know they could look, and I'm looking at the S and P 500, they could look like a negative number for the next 10 years, or they could look like the 1990 to 99 and compound at 18.7% a year. But what I notice is for sure that the S&P 500, and by the way, this is a good lesson. It's an individual asset class, basically. It's large cap blend, blend being some value and some growth, basically. But that's, if we call that a single asset class, compare that to where you have large and small and value and maybe value and growth, where you have more asset classes, what you'll see is the decade returns become smoother. They are not as volatile. So if you look, for example, at the all value, uh, by, by the way, that's just U.S., what it did in that same decade that the S&P 500 was down nine-tenths of 1% a year was go up 8.4% a year. And so maybe, maybe more diversification, even when it comes to asset classes, are going to tend to, to give the investor uh, more confidence along the way. Now I could talk about you could Chris. Did you want to throw anything down on the table on this anymore before we move on? Oh, just just that I think that it uh, it's a great message for people who can invest like Rip Van Winkle. Yeah. <laughs> if you can if you can buy and and then ignore you know uh, and uh, just turn away and and not pay attention to the ups and downs and the daily bumps. Uh, I, I think that the slide tells you you should have very good outcome and you should feel good about it. And there will, uh, you know, the downside will be swamped by the upside for having taken these prudent risks. Mm -hmm. uh, the the uh, the part that I still think any investor who tilts towards small and value needs to understand that's not shown though is the drawdown risk. So, uh, but we capture that in other places. Yep. Yeah, we do. And it's very similar, by the way. It is a little larger, but it's still, I think, with, within reason. It's, it's quite a bit larger than the difference in the ups and downs shown here. Um, and I think that's because it's monthly data and cumulative. Yeah. Got it. Got it. Uh, I also want to mention that this particular period, because we always have to remember, we're looking at a particular 52-year period. And the S&P 500 during this 52-year period compounded at basically 11%. It turns out, if you look at all the 40-year periods starting in 1928, the average compound rate of return was 11%. So there's, we always wonder whether we're looking at something that is a special period or a below average or above average. It turns out basically average in this case. All right, let's move on and look at briefly. We won't have to spend as much time, but we still have the green, we have the blue, we have the red uh, boxes to look at. And uh, all of a sudden, I notice over here on the right side that there were a, a couple of strategies that had 43 profitable years and only nine losing years. Now that becomes an interesting uh, advantage. Uh, and it just so happens that one of those is the 
four fund worldwide. Remember that four fund worldwide is 25% U.S. large blend, 25% U.S. Uh, small uh, blend. And then uh, this is the worldwide I'm talking about here. So it would be, I'll go back and say, it would be 25% in U.S. large blend, 25% international large value, 25% international small blend, and 25% U.S. small value. So it's, it's the combination of large, small value and growth but in both that and the all value portfolio, they had one more profitable and therefore one less losing year. And that served them well, because as you'll notice, the compound rate of return, for example, on the all value worldwide is 14%. The worldwide four fund strategy is 13.2. And by the way, so is the US four fund strategy, 13.2. And I can't help but notice that the $10,000 grew in the US strategy to 6.2 in the worldwide 6.4 and to the all value uh, 9.1 million dollars. So those are huge, huge uh, returns. And again, I don't wanna be overly optimistic, but when I look at the worst, the, the accumulation of all of the losing years of any of those three strategies, and we have recommendations on our site for all three of those portfolios that the it, it looks virtually the same in terms of, uh, uh, of downside uh, losses over this 52 years as the S&P 500. So um, I'm, I'm hopeful, I'm particularly thinking about the young people who have lots of time to go through all of these gyrations and hopefully not worry. Uh, I think people who are in their 70s and 80s might want to have more control than the kind of gyrations they'll go through. But it certainly creates, I think, a very hopeful picture. Now, I'm going to go on to the next in, in case you want to add anything, Daryl or Chris, to that page. No, I'm good. Good. Uh, just something we all know, but uh, listeners may have forgotten, the Worldwide Four Fund portfolio has historically performed very similarly to the Worldwide Ultimate Buy and Hold. So uh, right. so the positive things you said about yep. that for people who are invested in the Ultimate Buy and Hold, it it has also historically had this, this kind of a performance premium and consistency of performance that you pointed out. Yeah. So let me give you, I just happened to look that up because I was curious, Chris, as to what would the $10,000, what would it have grown to with the ultimate buy and hold strategy? And it was 4.8 million. Uh, that compound rate of return uh, is about, uh, I think, 12.6% uh, versus these at uh, around 13 to, to, to 14%. But but that was still uh, better than uh, most of the uh, of the portfolios that I looked at. In fact, in a few minutes, we'll see some other uh, his nationally known uh, portfolios and how they've done over this same period of time. I'm okay. surprised. Yeah. I'm surprised it's that big of a difference. I would have thought that the worldwide four fund and the worldwide ultimate buy and hold would be very close to the same return. Usually that's what we find. So that's a good question. Um, uh, we'll take we'll take a look at that when we get off here. And if we have to uh, make another comment on that when we get together next week, by golly, we'll we'll make sure we clarify that. Okay. But but uh, yeah, I, I've got it. My my memory is that the that it is uh, it is 12.6 on the uh, ultimate buy and hold. And, and Daryl, you probably got the uh, compound rate of return of the four fund U S only, uh, right there uh, in your, if you could take a look at the alt at the, um, yeah, fine tuning I, table. Yeah. The, the ultimate buy and hold the, well, the, the, uh, U S four fund is 13 to the worldwide four fund is 13 two. And I just went and looked at the ultimate buy and hold 
and it is indeed 12.6. Hmm. Now, now, 4.7, 4.7, 4 4.8 million for 10,000 invested. Okay, now we, this is an opportunity to make one other thing very clear. The fine tuning tables, and I talked about this last week in the fine tuning discussion, but the fine tuning tables, their returns are rebalanced on a monthly basis. So if you looked at the, the compound rate of return of the ultimate buy and hold rebalanced monthly, it's 12.3% versus 12.6% rebalanced annually. So even that makes a difference. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, there's so many variables in, 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 in what drives the outcome. As a matter of fact, uh, in a minute, we'll get on to some of these portfolios that represent portfolios that are managed by professionals. And the thing that these numbers aren't going to take into consideration is the 1% those, those professionals are charging to manage those portfolios. And, uh, and so that would even uh, have a huge uh, impact on the long-term returns. Okay, onward with this. Uh, now, we're not going to spend any time here at, at, on this page, particularly I'm thinking about the people who are listening to the podcast. Yeah. But here's the picture. It shows the one, the two, the three, four funds portfolios, and it shows their returns every year, each one of them, since 1970. So that you can then, and I think that ad addresses kind of something you brought up, Chris, and that is on a shorter term basis, we might see more volatility. I mean, certainly 73 and 74, you put those two together, you have um, a, a lot of volatility there. But it, this does give you a chance to compare these. And sometimes it is amazing how different what we think are, are legitimate, trustworthy, uh, hardworking strategies. I look at 1977, the S&P 500 lost 7.2, I think it's 7.2%. On the other hand, the total world market, uh, in fact, made 19.1%. So they're both large cap blend, but one's all U.S. and the other is a combination of U.S. and international. And the U.S. market, total market, plus the 30% small cap value for that same year uh, actually uh, made uh, 12%. And the total world made 23%. So the differences in one year at a time, and that's why I think these tables that show all these little numbers uh, for every year, I know it's a lot to look at, but the idea is that you say, wait a minute, if I get into any one of these strategies, I'm going to have periods where I'm really going to be scratching my head and saying, what's going on here? I mean, how come everybody else is making more money than I am? And that's the nature of any portfolio, any portfolio. And it's important to know about it beforehand rather than afterward. Want to add anything to that, gentlemen? Yeah, I, th I think the numbers you read for the, for the total U.S. and total world plus small cap value were actually from 78, Paul. Oh, <clears throat> Okay. But your point, your point is, is, ah, is you're right. You're right. Still, it's still somewhat valid. They're still yeah. valid. Um, yeah. When you look at this chart, for those who are looking at the video, this is, this is, you almost can't read it on the, on the screen. You need to look at the PDF, but I think um, the next chart, I think has a better visual representation. Okay. Of, oh, I like this. This is of, great. Of how you, how you can sort of separate the wheat from the chaff a yep. little bit. And it, yeah, it sort of smacks you in the face a little bit. Explain easier. what you got there, Daryl. Well, you're... this is the same chart as 3A1. But um, what this chart does is it for each one of the one fund, two fund, there's only one three fund. So for each of the one fund, two fund, and four fund portfolios, um, it looks at those set that set of, port of portfolios and says, okay, which, which one of those three or four or five uh, four par uh, portfolios had the best return that year and which one had the worst return that year and can I can the... I can I just ask you for sure to make sure 
as I read this table, it looks at all of them and it's the best amongst all of them, not just in your own group. Is that We're right? Even. We're even. You're right and I'm wrong this time. Yeah. Well, it's all right. It's all right. So, <laughs> no. Well, yeah, you're right. The the uh, it, it actually looks at, at the whole set of no nonsense portfolios. You're right. And and the best one for year given year is in green, and the worst one is in yellow. And so you can sort of stand back and just kind of look at where's the green and where's the yellow and 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 how does that how does that work for these, these, or how does that pan out for these different portfolios? Well, and you did something I think is, is, is super on this table. At the bottom of the table are all those decades we've been talking about. And you also showed the best and worst decades, uh, the per, or portfolios for each decade. And right. here's what I find interesting. The S&P 500, out of the five decades, let's call it, they were the best once. They were the worst twice. If you go to the all value portfolio, they were never the worst and they were the best three times. And then if you go to the all value US only, and I love this, this is a huge lesson. You were never first. Not one time was that strategy the best strategy of all of these. But what was the number one for the whole period? That all value US only. It was the best for the period, but never the best for a decade, which I think is a great lesson uh, for all of us. And I think that the, you've mentioned this before in, in, in many of the podcasts, and we've talked about it also, is that it, this is where it, it shows that it, it pays to have a, a longer term view and your ability to stay with your investments and, and stay the course, if you will, for a per periods longer than one yeah. year or two years or five years or even 10 years. Well, so, and I think, I think when we talk about how to put a portfolio together for a family, we'll have a chance to show some even better ways maybe to spread that risk. Okay. Now, as we go to table 1B, it's the same process. But in this particular period, I was, this presentation that I was doing for the White Coat Investors Conference, I was looking at their 150 portfolios better than yours. So, I, I use some different strategies that, except it, it, in the case of the, I think the total market US, but I looked at a whole bunch of different strategies, which included the Betterment portfolio, Frank Armstrong, the coffee house, uh, Frank Armstrong and Bill Schulteis of the coffee house are well-known national money managers using DFA funds. And so, as you would expect, they are well diversified. And then there's the uh, sensible portfolios and another organization that has a big fi uh, following. Then there's the SoFi portfolio. And then I decided and, and I was happy that, that Daryl was willing to do this. Let's throw in a new one that we've mentioned a little bit in the past, but we haven't, hadn't made it a part of the regular stuff that we do. The S&P 500 plus small cap value, 50-50, so that we could see not only the return, but the risk to find out, okay, we know we're turning up the heat here. What's the impact of that? And by the way, you'll notice on this table 1B uh, on the bottom there, the expense ratios that are being applied to each of these asset classes in, uh, in this study. And that's, that's important because this isn't just the index pure, it's index less an investment uh, uh, and expense to operate that as it would an index fund. Now, to be fair, uh, we didn't have that 50 year, 52 years ago. There were no index funds, number one. And number two, you couldn't get anything for one-tenth of 1%, but now you can. So I think Daryl made a, that was a legitimate decision to apply an expense ratio 
but apply the expense ratios that you would have today as a, as a new investor. So let's quickly uh, look at some of the outcome of this. Uh, and here, here again on table 2B1, two, two we run into the green, the blue, and the red. And I can tell you right now, you're going to find the same kinds of, of, of similar uh, down years, the accumulation of the down years, and you're going to see very similar uh, upside potential. I, I will, if I may, just focus in here for a second on the S&P 500 uh, and small cap value 50-50. Uh, because I think we'll be talking a lot about that strategy. And what I notice is that there were 41, I'm sorry, 43 up years and nine down years. And the total, the accumulated losses during the losing years, uh, they were 121% versus 141% basically uh, for the total U.S. market index. And in 2008, which was a bad year for everybody, uh, that combination of the S&P 500 and small cap value uh, lost 36.9% versus the S&P 500 at 37. So it made me think that there are probably a lot of young people uh, who are trying to make this process as simple as possible, who will see that combination of the S&P and small cap value as a, a legitimate equity, uh, equity holding. Uh, I'm, I'm going to go on to the next page unless you guys stop me. Go for it. All right. Thank you. Uh, on the next page, we see the four and six fund portfolios. And again, we see that the combinations on the upside, uh, on the downside are very similar. But there is one thing I find interesting. All of the six fund portfolios uh, are at Coffee House and, at, and Frank Armstrong, again, a DFA advisor and Betterment. These are all professional money managers. And what have they done to their portfolio? The same thing we've done with the 10 fund strategy, but they've done it with six. And that is to diversify so that you have, don't have too much in any one equity asset uh, in your portfolio, asset class in your portfolio. And the bottom line impact of that is all three of the, those three portfolios had returns between 11.8 and 12.5%. So three very fine returns. And it, it wasn't about finding any magic. It was just about expanding the diversification to include some value. Uh, and that was the main thing they did. And almost everybody who looks at the academic research uh, has done that. And certainly these folks have. So. Um, Anything else you guys see on that particular page that uh, uh, that you want to comment on? Nope. Okay. And another page of a long page of numbers. Again, that's for you to look at later. These are the annual returns of all of these portfolios. Again, the differences in those annual returns can be absolutely huge. Then we look at that. That, that wonderful way that uh, uh, Daryl has, has noted the, each year from 1970 through 2021, uh, what was the best and the worst amongst them. And it's interesting to note, in fact, I even, I even counted them up here. Hang on for one second, because the differences were uh, substantial. Uh, well, now, of course, I can't find my notes. Uh, but what I found was that the uh, number of losing periods, ah, here we go, for the total market index, for the total market index, uh, that, that's the couch potato, there were 11 green years, 
and for the yellow years, the worst, uh, there were 15 of those. I mean, that is a huge difference. Uh, now, I'm hoping I didn't Hang on, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Yeah, yeah, I think it's 15. On the other hand, when I look at the S&P 500 in small cap value, there were 14 greens and four yellows. I mean, that, that just says to me that capturing in that single two fund strategy, capturing the large through the S&P 500 and the growth through the S&P 500 and some large value through the S&P 500 and putting that together with a small and the value of a small value uh, was a terrific combination uh, in terms of dueling asset classes and would be very, very simple to, uh, to manage. Okay, let me move on. Actually, Paul, can you go oh, back? I just, yeah. I just want to make one comment Please, on yes, that. Yes, yes. Um, and that's the, uh, and you could see it in the previous uh, chart that had this same color highlighting. Uh, the S and P five hundred and U S small cap value has more of those greens in the early years than the later years, mm -hmm. and it, it you can kind of see if you back way up. There's a pattern here that these these investing styles come and go in terms of their ability to uh, to deliver the outperformance you expect or not. And some of the rationale or the reason for those early green years is probably inflation. Uh, yes. You know, we went through a period of inflation and value tends to do well yep. uh, in an inflationary period. So if there's a silver lining to the dark news that you hear today in the media about about inflation raising its ugly head, it's that you know maybe value is going to give us some of that outperformance again, and maybe small is going to deliver some of that outperformance again. Both of them tend to, you know, do well in different different uh, market regimes or different mm -hmm. uh, you know s pieces of the business cycle, and you can see that here re really really well visually. I think that's kind of cool. Well, I, great remark, Chris. And now I think we have made it through uh, these these uh, different portfolios. Hopefully, uh, the the lessons are are meaningful to to people. Uh, I I am I am curious now. Do we think we have time here, Chris, to uh, to to dive into this idea of how would you go about selecting uh, from these different portfolios? Well, we're at about 50 minutes, so it's your call. Do you want to you know, break it? You know, I I think we can go on. I do. Okay. I think we can. Uh, and and uh, so, Daryl, why don't you start? What would, what would you do with all of this information? Uh, and you can think as a, as a 25 year old or a 55 or a 75, whatever you want to do, lay it on us. What would you do? Well, there's a lot of lot of things to look at and to consider here. So, when I look at the the, um, I think I think the first thing to think about is is what strategy can I live with? Which one will I be able to stay the course on? And so, <clears throat> um, you can look that and that compared to what the returns actually are. Uh, show. So if you look at these, if you look at the no nonsense portfolios, um, there are there are many choices. There are several choices that could be could be good. You know, the, with, if you look at your your uh, compound aver average growth rates, there are many portfolios above twelve, and so that's a couple of anywhere from one to one and a half percent above the. S and P or the total market. So if you look at if you look at those portfolios, there are three of the two fund portfolios, and all three of the four fund portfolios do better. And so then you think, okay, well, what can I look at there? And if you go and look at the green, uh, green and yellow chart, then and you look at how those work out, um, you can say, well, the all value looks pretty good. Um, 
and the, the ride is smoother. If you look at the kegers down below, the, the 10 year decadal ride seems to be a little smoother. Although on the other hand, the all value Merriman looks pretty good. It's only a 10th of a percent less and the, the ride is a little bit rougher, but not significantly. Um, and you go look at, well, what does the total market or the S&P 500 in the no nonsense case look like? And it says, well, there are some years where it didn't do very well compared to the other ones. So, mm -hmm. uh, so what about what well, about the value, where I come down on this then yeah. is that now oh, yeah, some of these value strategies might be be pretty reasonable. So how risky? What, what are is what is there about an all value portfolio? And let me just share something that uh, I, I recently was working on some project, and so I decided I would just see what is a growth stock selling for today in terms of P-E ratio? What is a growth stock selling for in terms of its price to book? Uh, and in both cases, uh, the growth stock was about twice what the value stock was. The P-E ratio was way higher. The, the book book to uh, uh, price to book was much, much higher uh, in the growth. And so uh, it, it, there's a part of me that thinks, well, maybe actually, because value companies have been beaten up and aren't as volatile day to day necessarily as, as the really great growth companies, maybe an all value portfolio isn't all that risky particularly with this is an all value worldwide which means you're 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 getting exposure uh, globally as well as in the US but they're much less volatile companies one by one and so maybe it's not all that risky Chris what do you think I think it I, I think that tilting towards small and tilting towards value I uh, does give you a higher drawdown risk. And I think you can see that in Daryl's fine tuning tables. Um, we can uh, we can go pull up the numbers if you want, uh, but it on a on a month by month ba basis, if you're the kind of person who's going to look at your returns, you have to stomach bigger drawdowns. You have to stomach a bigger peak to trough decline in your account balance and stick with it to get those higher returns. That's how you earn them. Um, it's not shown in these charts because they don't show the drawdowns. But if you actually look at the drawdowns uh, for a tilt towards small in value or a tilt towards just value, uh, you'll you'll see it. And um, so I, I think um, when somebody's deciding on their portfolio and their investing approach, they have to assess their knowledge, their their risk tolerance. Um, a lot of a lot of it's going to come down at the start to what do you believe and what do you know, um, because education is what's going to give you that perseverance to tolerate the drawdown and stick with it. Right? Yeah. You you need to be you need to have knowledge. And then your risk capacity is a different thing from your risk tolerance. You, uh, if you're young and you've got a big inheritance, you may have an incredibly high risk capacity, but if you're a skittish investor, you, you may still have a very low risk tolerance. So you have to look at both sides of that coin. Um, and then I think you need to decide whether you want a lifetime auto adjusting solution, like a two fund for life strategy, or do you want to manage your glide path on your own? And, uh, you know, that's a pretty big fork in the road. Um, for a lot of people, they're going to struggle to stick with an investing strategy more than five to 10 years anyway. So if you're only going to, if you're only going to change in five to 10 years, it really doesn't matter whether you have a self-adjusting strategy or not, because when you change, you're going to reset it. But um, I think a lot of investors would be really well served by adopting a self-adjusting strategy and putting it on autopilot and ignoring it. Uh, so, so that's a pretty big choice. And then is it all in one account or is it multiple accounts? Yes. Because if it's all in a tax deferred account, well, then you can pick whatever strategy you want. But if you have to have some in a tax deferred account and some in a taxable account, well, now you have to think about how you're going to manage that, how you're going to rebalance it, um, where you're going to have the bonds. Um, 
whole bunch of interesting questions there. Uh, and then there's personal taste. You know, how much international can you live with? How much U.S. can you live with? I don't think that's going to drive your return so much, but it's going to drive your comfort and whether you sleep at night. And so that's important. And and then when you get to the end of all of those things and you've considered them and you've you've made a choice, you have to figure out, is it going to meet your needs? Is it going to do yeah. what you need it to do for you? And if it's going to do it, great. But if not, then you may have to go back and iterate and tweak and twiddle and say, okay, I really don't want to take that much risk, but I need to um, because that's what's going to get me to where I need to go. So I, I think it's um, it's a really interesting puzzle. And uh, for a lot of people, like I said, it starts with what you believe. You know, I had parents and grandparents who left me with firm beliefs in investing in the stock market. That made 80% of these choices simple and easy yeah. because I had this starting point that was visceral almost. You know, it was almost a faith-based decision. Mm -hmm. And I think for a lot of people, they start that way. But for those who don't, then it's going to be an education-based decision. You're going to have to learn what can I trust in? What can I believe in? Um, you know, what risks are going to feel prudent to me and then how do I take them and stay the course? And I, and I think you beautifully threw down the gauntlet here that we, we, we need people to take seriously. And that is to look beyond these, go to the fine tuning tables because the fine tuning tables we have all, not all of these, because we're, the fine tuning tables are only uh, focused on the strategies that we recommend, because I'm not recommending all of these strategies. We are simply comparing a broader group of strategies. And, uh, and so there's your chance, by the way, to, to look at the all value uh, worldwide strategy and it will show you in the fine tuning table what the worst drawdown was. What was the worst three, six, 12, 36, and 60 months? And, uh, and, and, and that would, I, I would hope, uh, give you uh, a, a better total picture. Uh, but I think having looked at these tables over and over again, that uh, at the end of the day, yes, you may have a drawdown along the way. For example, I'm only trying to pick out a number that uh, uh, I'm trying to remember. Uh, I think the S&P 500, uh, the worst drawdown is around 50%. Uh, and I believe uh, with the all value strategy, I think the worst drawdown is around 60%. Now, th that probably suggests then there were a lot of times that the S&P 500 went down more than the all-value portfolio did because they both added up to a very similar accumulated losses uh, number. So uh, those are there. They are there to help you make that decision because we're not sitting there as an advisor would and walking you through these numbers. You've got to do that study yourself. But let's never forget that one of the reasons we're trying to be a do-it-yourself investor is because we want to be paid. We want to pay ourselves that one half or 1% investment advisory fee. And the more you dig in and understand these numbers, I think the greater the probability you will collect that fee yourself rather than pay somebody else. So, um, oh, I know one thing I was going to ask. What about this? What about if uh, my wife and I, and we're both retired, but, but, but we have uh, IRAs, individual IRAs, and we have some Roth and some non-Roth, and, and then we have some taxable. Uh, if you had to pick one, let's just talk about young people here for, for the fun of it. If you had to pick one of these strategies, and, and, and Chris, I mean, you know the two funds for life inside and out, but let's say that we had somebody who could, could do the, the glide path on their own. Which strategy here for the first 20 years would you recommend 
to a young investor? You know, it's interesting. My daughter just uh, spent some time with me trying to figure out how she should be invested. She really wanted to do it on her own. She wanted to do the trades, the rebalancing, the investing of the latest money that she has in her Roth account. She wanted to, you know, open the brokerage account and learn which buttons to push and how to avoid making mistakes and all that good stuff. And she came up with her own portfolio, which is essentially the international, it's a worldwide version of the S&P 500 plus small cap value in a 50-50 split. The difference is that she has half S&P 500, and, uh, she's half US and half international. So 25% in an S&P 500 like funds, 25% in a US small cap value, 25% in an international total market and 25% in an international small cap value. Oh. And, and I think that is a brilliant place for That's her to great. be yeah. because she's very well, she, she has in four funds, all the things you normally talk about. She's half in large, half in small, half in US, half in international, yeah. half in value, half in blend. And she's very low cost and it's four funds that she can understand, she can manage. And, uh, and I think she's inoculated herself well with information to That's understand great. that she's gonna have different results from what she hears about in the news and that's okay. And so I think, I think that's an awesome place for her to start. I think it would be a great place for a lot of people to start, yeah. Daryl, 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 can you see another, <laughs> another portfolio? Yeah, I think so. <laughs> <laughs> I think but, that- I mean, I mean, let me go back and, and, and say something about that. I think that's, that's very good that she was able to do her own research and come up with her own, her own portfolio. That is tremendous. Um, and, and that harkens back to what, um, kind of what you said earlier, Chris, you know, there, you, you, you have to, you have to believe in something and you, you have to believe, you know what you believe in and you have to know what you know, or something like that. The, the difficulty with that a lot of times is a lot of, a lot of people, or a lot of times it's easy to believe something that's wrong. And it's also easy to believe you know something when you don't. And so the key there is you have, you have to know yourself. And, uh, and a lot of times that's not easy to do until you have experienced a real serious drawdown. And so uh, I think it's, it's difficult um, for younger people, I think, especially who haven't experienced the drawdown to wake up one morning and look at their portfolio and see that, you know, they, they had $10 yesterday and now they have eight. What happened? And so um, until, you, until you've actually done the work and believe it and, and, and understand, actually it's not belief, it's understanding how you got to where you are. It's the path you took and and the path you walked if you will to get where you ended up and and i think that's that's key to helping you stay the course um and and not be so concerned when you wake up one morning and find out that there's been a little drop in the market or maybe a not so little drop in the market but you've done something though daryl that i think is just uh so helpful to young investors those those tables that you created uh, that show you start with $83.33 a month or $1,000 a year, right. investing in all the different strategies that we recommend. And I know we're not updated for this year yet, but we will later. And, mm -hmm. and that's their chance to put together what does it look like during the tough times with any of these portfolios of the, of the portfolios. And by the way, I believe we've already done the work on an all, uh, all small cap worldwide, small cap strategy. Um, and we've, and we, and we've done not only, uh, I think we've done a fine tuning table with that, if I'm not mistaken, I, and I, I could be wrong on that one. But, but basically, by the way, th that's what uh, your daughter has done, Chris, 
but added the large cap international and U.S. blend. Uh, I, I think those tables that show what happens over time, adding money a little bit at a time, are, are really key for these young people to get a sense of what it could be like when they do wake up and it's eight, eight dollars instead of 10. So, hey, Paul, you know, we, uh, we have done the, the, oh, go ahead, Daryl. We have done the fine tuning tables for the, the worldwide all small cap value equity portfolio. Yeah, uh, yeah, it's good. Table B, it's table B12 in the fine tuning tables. And what's the um, what's the compound rate of return out of curiosity for the hundred percent equity portfolio? Yep, it is fourteen point two. There you go. I think that's even more than the small cap U.S. only. I think uh, it well, is. Well, I just happen to have it here. All U.S. small cap value is fourteen. Right. Ah, okay. There we go. That's great. That's great, Chris. What do you What do you got? It, well, I was just going to say there's another measure of risk that we haven't talked about at all during this presentation that I think is really, really important for retirees, and that's the safe withdrawal rate. And I, what you would find if if you cracked my book or if you go back to the fine tuning tables is that these better diversified portfolios that have a mix of uh, the small, the value, and the large have higher safe withdrawal rates than an S&P 500 portfolio or a total market portfolio. And the, the two fund for life strategies that bring in some bonds as well uh, do very well too. So I think for, for somebody who's a retiree who's thinking about risk, understanding the safe withdrawal rate capacity of the portfolio that they're in is really, really important because that's going to tell them basically how, how close to the running out of money line are you? And that's one that every retiree cares, cares a lot about, right? You don't want to, you don't want to cross the run out of money line. That's the biggie. Yeah, that's I, great. I would, I would look at, I think looking at the safe withdrawal rate when you're comparing portfolios, is a good way to assess the resilience to, to sequence of returns. Yes. It's a poor way to decide how much you should take out of your portfolio when you retire, I think. Um, because I think for the most part, nobody ever really follows a safe withdrawal strategy that way. That's based on that. I, would you agree that it's a, a, a very conservative way? Uh, most likely, oh yes. But I think because yeah, it's based on thing, the worst I think the case. key thing is to for it, though, is is not to tell somebody how much to take out. Um, you should. It's most likely a conservative answer, most probably is a conservative answer. But I think it to me, it's a it's a, a good way to assess resilience to sequence of returns risk because you're taking money out of this portfolio. And how does it behave when you do that and you take them out in the down years and then and you take it out in more down years and you have more down years and you take it out. And so the key thing is that is how does it how do, how is does that portfolio able to recover? And in a way, that's one of the good things about when you look at the at the uh, telltale charts we've done on small cap value, for example, versus the total market or S&P 500 is it kind of bounces along and hangs in there with the S and P 500, but then all of a sudden, you know, it'll, it'll go crazy. It'll, you'll have a very, very high outperformance against the S and P 500 or total market over a relatively short period of time. So you can make up your downfalls in the past. You've been able to make up your downfalls uh, or the drawdowns in a, in a, in a, over a reasonable investment time horizon of 10 to 15 years. I've got an idea, you guys, because we got distributions coming up in the coming weeks. And these are, I think, some great topics uh, when we get those tables and we can lay them out there for, for people to take a look while we're going through them. So, gentlemen, I, I appreciate so much uh, what you bring to the table. Uh, in, uh, in 2012, I would never have ever imagined we would be giving this much value to the people uh, following our work. And I, I really want to thank you. I, I get emails virtually every day 
thanking you guys for 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 what you do, and uh, and and boy, I I join them. It's it's great. Thanks for being here today to help me. Thanks for doing all these tables and being thoughtful to help people become themselves more thoughtful. So, uh, and by the way, Chris, give 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 out the name of your book, where they can get it, and uh, and how much is it? <laughs> uh, two funds for life. So simple. Uh, two funds for life, and then the sub the subtitle is a quest for simple and effective investing strategies. It's available on Amazon. It's I, uh, I think it's nine ninety nine for the Kindle book, uh, which has the advantage that it's in color and you can look at it on a big screen. Uh, it's nineteen ninety nine for the print version, which is in black and white. And I know some people have said, "Gee, why isn't the print version in color?" And the reason is it would have been a forty dollar or fifty dollar book if we did it in color, and maybe we will someday. Um, and I. Uh, I, I, I love the feedback that we've gotten around the book and look okay. forward to more. Yeah. And where do the profits go? Profits all go to the foundation. All right. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. You're very kind. All right, so guys. They couldn't have done it without the foundation. So it was just paying back. Yeah, that's great. Well, you, you, you both have paid back a ton and, uh, We'll uh, be, be back here next week again uh, with another one of these. I think we're doing uh, accumulation, if I'm not mistaken, uh, uh, coming up here uh, next week. So stay tuned and we'll, uh, we'll be helping you hopefully have a better financial future. Thanks for listening. It's Paul Merriman with Sound Investing. Sound Investing, soundinvesting.com, and paulmerriman.com are produced and exclusively owned by Paul Merriman, who is solely responsible for their content. For more information, free articles, mutual fund recommendations, and more, visit paulmerriman.com.